You know, Paul told Timothy, he said, stir the spirit within you. That's what we do during worship. It's what we do, even this song. You guys, like, you hear that music right then, it just makes you want to go into action. I've got some of that too. Actually, I started a, it's not a New Year's resolution. It was like a new life resolution I started back in December. Um, and it went into the new year, and I'm doing pretty good at it, but I started a fitness program because I'm 43, and I'm feeling like I'm 50, and I don't like that. So my, 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 my little girls, I'm wrestling with them on the floor, and I'm winded just wrestling. I mean, I've got twin girls, y'all, so we, come on. It's, it's a double time, right? I'm wrestling the floor with them, and I'm getting winded, and I'm like, I got to get, I got to, I got to start working on myself. So my wife sent me this motivation music. It actually was some uh, Viking motivation music, because I like to, I like to, to work out with, with some motivation in my ears, you know, it pumps me up, like that music we just heard. And I didn't like the Viking so much, because I don't know what those guys are about. I heard they were in some pretty nasty stuff back in their era. So I switched this to some Hebrew battle music, and I promise you guys it's really working. I almost went to the gym this week, and <laughs> I feel like I'm ramping it up, right? <laughs> so seriously, I'm, like, get, get in this music. The point is, stir yourselves up, guys. Get yourself stirred up with the Spirit. You got to wake up. You got to put yourself in a position where you're not going to love the way you feel or how cold it is outside, or if the weather comes, all that stuff, or whatever circumstances in life, you've got to build yourself up in your most holy faith. You've got to stir the spirit within you, and that's why we're talking about Battle Ready. Have you enjoyed this series so far? Come on, guys. For everybody online, you guys can join in with the notes there. Make sure you comment. Let us know you're there. You can also get these message notes on Version Bible app. Just go to the events and uh, uh, put in Journey Church of the River Region, and you'll be able to pull up these notes. So let's jump into this today, guys. The very first uh, thing we want to understand is that putting on the armor of God is to put on Christ. And I want you to keep this theme throughout the entire message, that this is your responsibility to put this on. Okay? These things are given as directives. They're not one of those things we pray and ask God and say, well, God, would you, would you put on the body of, I mean, would you put on Christ for me? He's empowered you to do it, but you've got to actually make that decision to put it on. This very first line gives that same directive. Stand, therefore. It's telling you something to do. You have to decide to do it. It's not something that's going to happen just to you automatically. You have to choose by what's been empowered to you. You have to choose to stand. So we're going to recap some of this. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace in all circumstances. Everybody say that. In all circumstances. One more time like you mean it. In all circumstances. We don't deplete. Say it one more time. In all circumstances. Very good. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with, with which you can exist or extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is what we have to understand, that this armor is our grace given ability to fulfill God's will on the earth. And so what does it mean to put on the armor of God? It is your responsibility to put this on. It's your grace-given ability to put on Christ in the earth and carry out his will and purpose in order for the Father to fulfill his will through you. And I say that for the purpose of being in battle. No one, no one really goes to battle uh, for themselves. We usually go to battle to defend other people. Think about the military, right? We come together as a band of brothers as, uh, and sisters and come together and we defend other people. Now, we can use that same thing to defend ourselves, and we're going to talk about a little bit about that as well. But just understand that your job here, as Jesus prayed, Father, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, think about that sometimes. Don't read right over these scriptures and, and just pass them off. I want you to think about it. How is it in heaven? Because Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you, and you're supposed to be delivering the kingdom of God. Right here in this chapter, uh, in this book, Ephesians, Ephesians 3, think about this. Let your mind wrap around this for a moment. That it said that the manifold wisdom of God has been given to the church to make it known to the world. And that's not in your notes. You can write that down. The manifold wisdom of God has been given to the church in order to make it known to the world. So the first thing you have to understand is it is your responsibility. This is something that you've been given. The armor is our grace given, our empowered given by God, ability to fulfill God's will on the earth. And one more thing. 
I want you to put this on, let this be in your mind. Let this be something that you, that you meditate on leaving here today. And I want you to say it with me. I'm going to give it to you, and then I want you to repeat it after me. Say, God's will is to be fulfilled in my life so that I can deliver him to others. Say that with me. Say, God's will is to be fulfilled in my life so that I can make it available to others. So it's my relationship with him so he can have a relationship through me. Does that make sense? That's taking the emphasis off that it's not just about you. It's about the enemy trying to defeat you so that you don't fulfill God's will in the earth. Keep that theme all the way through. So what does it mean to put on Christ? It means what Romans 13 starts to say, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. It means that I no longer live for myself. Put on Christ that you may not gratify the desires of the flesh. You put on Christ because it's not just about sinning and stop smoking and stop drinking and doing bad habits. Those things will come automatically because you're seeking after him. You don't, I'll tell you the truth. You don't even have to strive for that. I was doing some prison ministry some years back at uh, Frank Lee work release. And a guy came to me and he said, man, I'm really struggling with this. And I'm a believer, but I, I, I keep, I keep uh, you know, popping these pills and it keeps getting me in trouble. And another guy came and said, man, I really want to stop smoking. And I said, listen, stop trying to get rid of that stuff and start surrendering to the Father. And it'll wash all that stuff out. The more you labor for it, the more you're relying on your own strength. You have to surrender. So surrender, putting on Christ, means that I no longer live for myself. I live for him. And when I live for him, I take on his desires and his commission. He commissions me, and I do it for him. I'm not doing it for myself. I'm doing it so I can be effective. Me wanting to get in shape is so I can, not because I want to look good or any of that stuff, but honestly, I do want to feel better, but it's mainly so that after five, eight minutes of playing with my little girls, I don't have to stay, stop and say, hey, hey girls, give, give dad a break. You see, it robs them of something they need from me. It robs them of something they need from me. And by you not being battle ready, you're robbing the world, the people around you, you're robbing them of something that they need from you, which is Jesus. So you can't live any longer for yourself. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me in the life that I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In the same way, you give yourself for others. It means that I no longer fulfill the desires of my flesh, but I live according to the Spirit. And you say, yeah, but that's a little bit vague and conceptual. What does that mean to live according to the Spirit? Well, first of all, if we're, we've been talking about these. We're talking about the last steps in this, in this armor of God. So it takes you deciding to take these armor pieces and actually put them on every day, which includes the Word, prayer, walking in faith, deciding that you're not going to waver. And I'm not talking about just conduct, guys. Please hear me. I'm not just talking about, well, i got to be a good person. It's not about that. If you have relationship with the Father and you're seeking him intimately, you're seeking Jesus intimately, these things will fulfill themselves in you. Psalm 37 says, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. And that's kind of two ways. He'll give you desires of your heart that are righteous desires, but he'll also give you new desires. Like you take on his desires. You understand? Like you have a responsibility to seek him so that you come into his desire because it's your job to, to steward your salvation and to put off your flesh. So I no longer, it means that I no longer fulfill the desires of my flesh, but I live according to the spirit and living according to the spirit is doing the things that the spirit would have you do. Yeah, but what does that feel like? Well, let me give you an example. Just, just talking about battle ready and we'll get to the mind in just a few minutes, but just an example 1 Corinthians 13 is the whole passage just talking about love is patient, love is kind. And at the end of it, it says, of all these, these three abide, love, faith, and hope. Or in the order that it states it, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love, right? All right. So first and foremost, I get this question a lot, and you've had this question, if you've asked me this question or you've been in a discussion, you probably hear me say it, because I think it's a really simple way of you understanding the voice of God. You say, oh, how do, how do I know I'm being led of the Spirit? How do I know I'm, that I'm hearing the voice of God? 
Because the voice of the Father, the voice of the Holy Spirit, will never speak in anything contrary to faith. He'll never speak anything contrary to hope. He'll never speak anything contrary to love. So what does that feel like? If you feel hopeless, that's not his voice. If you're feeling discouraged, that's not his voice. If you're feeling separated from him and unloved, that's not, your, that's not his voice. If you're feeling like, Things are impossible, that's not his voice. That's the voice of the enemy working you against the things that God, and that's all it takes. That's all it takes to walk according to the Spirit is to fulfill those thoughts, those mindsets. You've taken captive thoughts that that cause the enemy to lose his ammo against you. So if it's destructive, it's not of the Father. If it's not life-giving, it's not of the Father. You understand? So let's simplify what it means to walk according to the Spirit is that you fulfill the fruits of the Spirit that you'll also find in Galatians 5. You fulfill those by making yourself known to them. You surrender yourself to those things. You're not trying to strive and make it happen. But I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, the sinful nature. Did you guys know that was in the Bible? Because I think there's sometimes these mindsets like, well, it's just inevitable, you're going to sin. Listen, I get the probability that you're going to, but it's not inevitable that you have to. Otherwise, the epistle of John wouldn't have written to his church and said, guys, my children, I'm writing this to you that you do not sin. But if you do, that's a contingency. If you do, you have an advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's put off the mindset that, well, it's just inevitable. I'm not a perfect person. Well, the Bible actually says different in the spirit. I know in the flesh we still have things that we do battle against, but that's what we're talking about, putting off the flesh, right? Remember, it's a directive. It's not like optional. He's telling you what to do. Just like the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all the nations. It's not like a suggestion. He's saying you can do this. You've been empowered to do this. So where John actually says, little children, I write to you that you do not sin, but if you do, that means it's possible that you don't have to. Now, a lot of people are going to frown at me for saying that, but I didn't say it. It's in the Bible. (laughs) Because it says this. You guys know this was in here. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not fulfill or gratify or accommodate the desires of your flesh. So it's kind of like deciding if if you got a bad, like, soda habit, like you drink Coca-Cola a lot. And you, you, you fill a glass of Coke and you take a, a water hose or another container of water and you start pouring it in and it flushes out from underneath and eventually all you have is water there. Well, you didn't have to get up and pour the water out. I mean, pour out the Coke. Instead, you started flushing the stuff out and that's what that means. If you'll walk by the Spirit, you'll start flushing out the desires of your flesh. And now suddenly things that used to be temptation to you are no longer temptations. They're just not. They're temptations by nature, but they don't have any hold on you any longer. Not because you strove to try to get rid of them, but because you surrendered it to him. You decided to walk and set your mind on the things of the spirit. I know you guys have probably heard this analogy before, but any bankers in the room, if you're online, drop it in the comments, I'm a banker, or I handle finances, you count money. And years ago, I don't know this from personal experience, but I've, but I've always been told that, that when they train you to count money or to, see, to find counterfeits, they don't train you to see what a counterfeit looks like, they keep you handling the authentic stuff so that when you come across a counterfeit, it stands out like a sore thumb. Right? It's the same way here. When you, the sinful nature has been surrendered to Christ, sin in the world still exists. So, so I mean, by nature, it's still a temptation of its own in and of itself, but it no longer has a hold on you. Now, keep in mind, this is not just about, hey, I want you to do good and be good and so you can make it into heaven. Remember, the common theme is I put on Christ so that he can be made known through me to the earth. It's not just about me being a good person or trying to please God. Why does God want want you to have goodness coming out of you? Not so he can stamp approval on you. If he had to do that by your own works, then you wouldn't need Christ. He needs it so the enemy can stop defeating you through those little threads of temptation and blockages. It also means that you put on the new nature. 2 Corinthians 5 actually says, and this is not in your notes, write it down, go look it up. 2 Corinthians 5 says, you are a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, everything has become new. Everything has become new. You say, well, Jeremiah, I don't feel new. It doesn't matter how you feel. 
Now, I'm not de demeaning how you feel, but I'm saying you should determine, we, we, we read it earlier, in all circumstances, right? Don't live by how you feel. Feelings are going to be there for sure, but that doesn't mean they're trustworthy. Just because you have a feeling doesn't mean it's trustworthy. I think pretty soon we're actually going to start a series on that, of what your feelings are not. Your feelings are not the Word of God. They're not adequate to determine things or to be a directive or a dictator in your life. Emotions are there to serve you, not, to, not to, for you to serve them. So putting on your new nature is acknowledging what Jesus is in you, who Jesus is in you, who the power of the Holy Spirit is in you, and you actually setting your mind on those things. Not setting your mind on natural things, but setting your mind on the things of the kingdom of God and chasing after those things. You decide that. You make a decision to go after that. And what you end up doing is robbing the enemy of all of his tactics against you. Again, a directive, whose responsibility is it? You. There could be a parenthesis here. You put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So now let me give you a principle. Everything contrary to this newness that you have in Christ is not your true identity. It's the deception of the enemy to try to get you trapped into this old nature. How does the enemy deal with you? Same way a bad influencing friend. When I was growing up, my mom... You know, she'd try to guard me and say, hey, you, you, you might not need to hang out with them. They're influencing you a little bit. So it's like having a bad friend hang over your shoulder. And every time you want to have a, a, a right direction or you, every time you're prompted to do something in, in, a, in a positive or, or life-giving or, or uh, constructive instead of destructive direction, you want to have peace, you want to have joy, you want to walk in love, you don't want to be hopeless, you don't want to be discouraged, the enemy's going to work against all of that stuff. And he's going to be hanging on your shoulder and saying all of the wrong things that are opposite to encouragement. That's how he whispers. He whispers through your mind. And the way it happens is it's just like me speaking to you. You hear it with your natural ears. You process it here, and then it takes root if you let it. Well, the enemy works the same way. It's just not through an audible voice. The Father speaks the same way too. You comprehend it somehow because it's in the Spirit. He doesn't require a physical mouthpiece, you comprehend it through the Spirit. It's not audible all the time. And the enemy will work on you that way too. And so to the same extent, to the whole extent that you sometimes will wonder, well, how do I know it's the voice of the enemy? Or how do I know it's the voice of God versus my own voice? Number one, your voice in the Spirit will always sound like God because the Bible says that you become one. That's what Jesus prayed in John 14 through 17, that they become one in us as I am in you and they are in me, that they'll be one in you. You're one with God. His mind is your mind. It says that you have been given the mind of Christ, Paul said. So every constructive and producing life-giving thought is coming from him. So now that we've set that groundwork, let's go through these, these last uh, few elements of the armor. As shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel, the good news of peace. Putting on those shoes is you deciding that you're going to be a bearer of peace. That means in every circumstance, no matter what's going on, in fact, contrary to the circumstances, you're going to decide and say, I'm not going to bow to these circumstances. In fact, I'm going to give life to the circumstances around me. You may want to jot this down a little bit. If my circumstances can change my, change my mood or change my direction, then your circumstances have become Lord. It's a hard pill to swallow, but it's a very sobering, good way to gauge your life. If my circumstances can determine how I feel, then maybe I'm, I'm living under the circumstances. We say that all the time. Well, how are you doing? Well, under the circumstances. Well, get out from underneath the circumstances. Stop living in subjectivity to the natural elements of this earth and set your mind on the things of the kingdom. You're awfully quiet. It's either really good or really bad. 
Take your mind off of the things of the nature. Stop thinking. Stop finding your joy in what can be done here in the earth for yourself and start having joy in what you're fulfilling for the will of God. And you'll forget all about those other things and you'll have fulfillment in life you've never experienced before. So it means you be a bearer of peace. The word shalom, the Hebrew word shalom, means peace, but what does peace encompass? It actually encompasses wholeness, completeness, health, safety, harmony, and prosperity. Everything that Jesus came to bring, when he mentioned it in Luke chapter 4, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the good news and set the captives free, to bring liberty to the captives, to, to, to bring good news to the poor. That's your job. Well, just like a water hose delivering water, you're filled with the same thing that you're delivering. Because the Bible says out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. You're a spring of life. But you have to choose to put it on. So you become a bearer of peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus says, for they shall be called the sons of God. And that word sons there translates as both male and female. It's gender neutral because it actually means just offspring. You've actually become the offspring of God. Just like John 1, 12 says, that as many believed in him, he gave the right to be called. And some translations say children. The original is sons because it means the same thing. But you are his exact offspring. It's not by the flesh or blood or by your parents' will. It's by your spirit that you're born again. And you have to set your mind on those things of spirit and get out of the natural mind in order for it to be real. It also means to put on the shoes is to always be prepared. It means you stay ready. Now, that's, that, that's what my, my, my fitness goal is about. You know, I, don't, I want to be able to honor the Father in spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, I want to be seeking him intimately. I want to be renewing my mind to the word of God, to renew my soul. Because all these things have been given, me to this, given to me by the Spirit, but it's my job to steward this and to grow in them. Romans 12, 2 says you become transformed by what? Renewing your mind. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of mind. So what is, the, what is the opposite of that? If I'm not renewing my mind, I'm not being transformed, right? So always be prepared means that I don't let, let down my guard. I stay focused on the Father. I keep my eyes on Jesus. And just like Peter stepping out of the boat when Jesus said, Peter said, Lord, if that's you walking on the water, then bid me come. And he said, come on. He steps out of the water, out of, out of the boat on the water, and looks at Jesus. And he starts walking toward him. And then he takes around and looks at the circumstances instead of keeping his eyes on Jesus. And when he sees the circumstances, fear encroaches on him and he begins to sink. Fear became a ruler to him in that moment instead of Jesus being Lord. And your whole life is like that. Be ready by keeping your eyes on Jesus, renewing your mind to the Word of God, staying in prayer, adding in some fasting. And just to simplify fasting, fasting means that you're going to abstain from a meal or two or three or two or three days. And you're just going to seek him in word and prayer. That's all it means. Always be prepared. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Now, Reprove, rebuke, that's not, remember the last word after that is exhort. Rebuke is not harshness. Rebuke is not you judging somebody and say, well, are you, what are you doing with your life? What are you doing in the word of God? That's not yours to judge. Your, jo your job is to challenge in an encouraging way to encourage people to elevate their pursuit of God, their pursuit of intimacy with Jesus. Your job is not to judge them, so don't get that re rebuke out of order. Rebuke just means to course correct. It means to bring correction to you and, and instruct in a better way. But this is your job. Be ready in season, out of season. Preach the word. Be ready to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming, and now it is, by the way, when people will not endure sound teaching. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith. Hold it up. Where's the, where's the directive here? It's a directive. You are to hold up the shield of faith. You are to uphold it. You don't pray and ask God, God, would you hold my shield of faith for me? No, he said, I've empowered you. I've given you the ability to do so. Just like the, the armies, you know, like Pastor Mike said a couple weeks ago, uh, the Gladiator movie. I, I love the Gladiator movie. I love... Uh, watching any type of historical uh, battle movie like that, The Patriot with Mel Gibson, 
Um, Braveheart is my favorite. And how they join together like a band of brothers, and they'll put that shield there, and it becomes a solid wall. You know what that means for you? That means joining with other people in mutual discipleship where you're sharpening one another and holding each other accountable. Next Sunday is Life Group Rally. If you're not in a life group, and if you know somebody that's not in a life group, listen, it's not just because we're trying to build big groups. You can do that any, anywhere in the world. We want you to be in community and discipleship so you're one of those people with that shield standing there and creating a wall. And you stand with that wall and saying, we will not be defeated. But if you stand by yourself, you're like prey, being separated from the flock, and the wolves come. Jesus warned of that. So in addition to all these things, you hold up the shield of faith. You put it on to stop all the fiery arrows of the devil. He will discourage you, try to cause you not to produce things out of faith. But the Bible says the only way to bring pleasure, only way to please God is by faith. You can't walk by sight. You have to walk by what the word says over how you feel, over what you see in order to bring about what the kingdom of God is. The example of Jesus feeding five loaves and, and, and two fish and multiplying it among fifteen to 20,000 people started with him asking the question to the disciples or them presenting the options of, hey, we've got five loaves and two fish. And he said, they said, Lord, how are we going to before that? He said, how, how are we going to feed all these people? And he said, you feed them. And they started to think naturally. Yeah, but all we have is five loaves and two fish. I mean, they've seen this guy do miracles, and now they're going to default, resort back to a natural Thought process, that's what we're talking about. Get your mind off of natural expectations and start thinking about walking on water. And whatever application, analogy you can apply that to in life, set your mind on the possibilities of the kingdom, not the impossibilities of natural restrictions. God can move and will move and has already moved in your life. You just have to believe it by faith. So then what is faith? Hebrews 11.1 I love this translation. It says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence for the things we cannot see. So oftentimes, faith is kind of like this abstract thing. Well, I'm not sure what faith is. It tells you right here in Hebrews 11 that it is the reality. It is the evidence. Is faith just some abstract concept in mind? I'm not sure how to use it. No. It's the action based off of what you believe. So if you need a definition for faith, it is the action based off of your belief. Faith is the action that follows belief. It is the evidence. It is the reality. So it means you're going to carry out this life of Christ and salvation because you believe there is a God. You believe and know by historical evidence and by your own presence, evidence in your own life, his presence of evidence in your life, that there's an eternity you're going into. And you're going to walk this thing out and you're going to stay steadfast on it. You're not going to let the enemy de deceive you and trap you. You're going to hold that reality as evidence. Just like Abraham, it says he never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this, in this he brought glory to God. When him and Sarah were looking to have a child, he said, I'm old. Natural thinking, right? Say this. Say, I'm going to stop. Come on, everybody. Say, I'm going to stop thinking naturally. Father, help me to think spiritually. Set my mind on the kingdom, not on the earth. Amen means so be it. Would you say amen to that? Because that's the deal that you're supposed to be walking after to fulfill his will on the earth. That's what Abraham did. Abraham saw what God said, compared it to Sarah's life, her body, his life, his body, and said... Even Sarah questioned, well, well this, this is ridiculous. This is impossible. And she laughed at it. But God already said something. So the question is, are you going to take what God has said and let it speak louder than your circumstances? Are you going to take what God said and allow it to speak louder than your past experiences? Move forward. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. Are you fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises? This is your shield of faith. When you're fully convinced, you won't waver. And actually, going back to that action, that faith is the evidence, it is the reality, it is the substance. 
If you keep reading in uh, Hebrews 11, the whole hall of faith there with all these people that did amazing things of faith, it actually says that, that Abraham's faith was brought to completion because of his action. In other words, he didn't just sit idle and say, well, yeah, I believe you, God. He got moving forward, and it, got, it, got, it became fulfilled because he took a step forward. You understand that? It actually says that, that, that because he obeyed God, because he moved, it brought his faith to completion. So faith is a thought mindset of belief. It's an imagination of what is possible. And then it is the follow through of taking action in that direction. And it says, God accounted it unto him for righteousness. So he was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. Ask yourself that question, am I fully convinced? Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation is all things pertaining to the, fil the fullness of life in Christ. Redeemed from sin, fully fulfilled in the mission and the accomplishment of God's work, not your work. The finished work on the Christ, when Jesus said, it is finished, then trust it is finished. You don't have to work for it anymore. Salvation is everything that pertains to everything that Jesus did to fulfill a life of eternity for you. But in earth, in the earth, it is you to be able to produce it for other people. So this is the definition. Our complete, it means completeness. Lacking nothing. In the Greek, the word is sozo, which is very similar to the word shalom that we read earlier. Our complete salvation is in Jesus, Yeshua, the Strong's H3, 3444 4, is the word for salvation. When you look up the word salvation in the Old Testament, especially in the Old Testament, any time, such as the one we're going to show you, in Psalm 13, 5, but I have trusted in your steadfast love, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Every time you see that word salvation in English, the translation is God's salvation or Yah salvation, Yahweh's salvation, which is Yeshua. Now, there's debates over is it Yeshua or was it Yahshua like as in Yahweh? It doesn't matter. The translation is still the same. It is God's provision. It's his completeness and wholeness. God has put all things under Christ's power and has made him to be the head leader over all things to the church. This is your head. This is your salvation. If Christ is your head, then that is your helmet of salvation. If he is truly Lord, not just Savior, then he is your helmet of salvation. And by setting your mind on the things of Christ, you will guard yourself against those things that try to enter in through the enemy's deception and through the way your flesh feels. You have to put on Christ. You have to put on the helmet. You have to make sure salvation is your focus. That Christ's power has made him to be the head over all the church. So now Paul reads this in Ephesians 1. As Pastor Mike already said, go through the whole book of Ephesians. If you need to read the Bible, go through John, the Gospel of John. Go through Ephesians. It's a great summary of who you are, your identity in Christ, and how to remain battle ready. What is your commission in the earth? Who were you and who you are now? Set your mind on those things. Renew yourself to that. But this is what Paul says. I love this. It says, praying, asking God, the, glory of, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with the light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called. That his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above all any ruler, authority, any power or leader, anything else, not only in this world, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ's power and has made him to be the head leader over all things of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete. Put those two together. Say it with me. It is made full and you're lacking in nothing. You've got shalom. You've got sozo. You've got salvation. It's all completed in you. Full and completed by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. You have to trust that first and foremost. This is your helmet of salvation. 
So today, when you're walking through this stuff and you're taking notes, I want you to, to really keep in mind that this is a directive. Putting on the armor of God is the directive. It's your responsibility. Jesus is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word where the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. The emphasis is on He. He is the Word of God. He was in the beginning with God. Jesus, eternal. So as you're moving forward in this, this is what I want you to, to, to write it on a sticky note somewhere. Put a reminder on your phone. Realize, number one, that it is my responsibility to put on the armor of God. Remember how we started? That this is God's grace given ability to you but he honors your will he wants you to be a partner with him it doesn't happen automatically salvation doesn't happen automatically that's called universalism the idea that just because jesus died everybody's going to heaven and matthew 7 21 actually says contrary it says not everyone who stands before me and calls me lord will enter the kingdom of heaven but lord we did a lot of things we were busy we were doing all, all kinds of things in your name and he says but i never knew you Depart from me, you work of iniquity. But it also says that God's not slow to fulfill his promises. He's just patient because he doesn't want anybody to perish. That's love. That's a true father. But it's your responsibility. Salvation is your responsibility to take it on. It's been offered by grace, appropriated by faith. And everything else that comes in the life of salvation happens the same way. It's already been given to you. It's got to be appropriated through you trusting it, believing it honoring it, in, in, in trusting your whole life to it, to make Jesus Lord, not just Savior. So realize that it is my responsibility to put on the armor every day. If you need a battle-ready song, I'll share mine with you because it does get me stirred up. I wasn't kidding about that. When I do make it to the gym, I'm going to plug it in my ears. I'm going to be trucking it. Y'all be praying for me. Let it pump you up. Worship pumps you up. Our worship this morning was awesome. I say this, I say this not, not, I say this in a positive, challenging way. Is your expression of worship just a knot on the log, or are you pouring out your heart to the Father? And I don't care how that looks. You can be like this, you can be like this, you can be like this, you can be like this. It doesn't matter. It's He knows. But are you focused on Him? Are you really in tune? Are you really pressing? to acknowledge him and to lift him up as you worship. And the last thing is to make Jesus Lord over all areas in my life, not just to make him savior, but to let him be Lord, not let circumstances, not let the earth circumstances, not let relationship circumstances, not let the waves come in. You're, you've been called to walk on water and do miraculous things. Don't let the waves distract you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. The only way you get distracted is to take your eyes off of Jesus. Put on Christ. And if you never experienced that before, I'm telling you, it is an amazing life. It's a peaceful life. Challenges happen. I love, I've come to love the challenges because they cause me to, to fall on my knees. So when I fight, I fight on my knees. And he fights my battles. It's fun. It's not easy, but it's fun. And if you've never experienced that, we want to give you that opportunity. Or even if you just want to go deeper and make sure you trust him deeper, we're going to give you that opportunity. I want to ask you guys to bow your heads so that no one's looking around in case anybody needs that private moment. If there's anybody in this room that says, Jeremiah, I have never trusted God that way before. I've never taken time to put on the armor, but I want to today. I've been putting it off. And I've let many moments pass me by, but I don't want to let this one pass me by. Today, I want to give my full trust to the Father. Would you put your faith, your trust in Jesus to start putting on Christ so he can use you in the earth? If you've never done that before, but you would like to, slip your hand up. I'm the only one looking. If you're online, you can text my decision to 94,000. Leave a comment. We'll reach out to you. But if today you want to put your trust in Jesus and you've never done that before, put your hand up. And let's all pray this together. Heavenly Father, 
I want to trust you with my life. There are still areas where I have not surrendered to you, but I surrender them now, knowing that you're working out these details. The details are too overwhelming, but you know them. and You fulfill them in me. So I surrender right now to put on Christ, not just to make you my savior, but to make you my Lord. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. You guys, we're going to go back into worship. There'll be a prayer team down here ready to pray with you. Even if the moment bypassed you and you want to give yourself to Jesus, come pray with one of these. And let's jump back into worship and pour out your hearts for gratification of your flesh, of your spirit, of your mind. You're going to gratify yourself in him and give your gratitude to him. Amen? Let's stand to our feet.